I think this episode is far too unrealistic. I mean, come on, a card that is so obviously flawed. We should present a more interesting attack. Uh, maybe something with data dependencies in there, some kind of differential power analysis. Uh, we will have to rewrite the whole episode. I know what is this is. That's an oscilloscope. It's, uh... What's going on here? But what do you attack then? This, for example. I think my card broke. Let's try mine. It's cloning a card. Um, how would the attacker start with that? Well, first of all, the card cards must run constant time cryptographic code because otherwise you could just look at the power trace and immediately see um, the key. Okay. Especially if we consider implementations of symmetric cryptographic algorithms like AES, which do process uh, the key in larger chunks, mm -hmm. uh, you should probably learn about more powerful techniques um, like differential power analysis first. Yeah. yeah, so um, the power consumption of the device depends on what the device is computing and also the data which is involved in these computations. So for the attack that we just discussed, the setting was kind of easy. We considered non-constant time asymmetric crypto, we processed the key bit by bit, we had a single trace, this was sufficient to easily leak the key. But um, if we now consider symmetric cryptography, which uh, is much easier to implement in a constant time manner, and which also usually processes the key in larger chunks, the situation gets actually quite a bit more difficult quite fast. Yeah, but now we want to show them uh, some more powerful attacks, some more realistic attacks. If um, the visual inspection is not sufficient, mm -hmm. that you can see the key, you can also try to do something more sophisticated, for example, you could um, try to find differences between multiple power traces and uh, make something which is called differential power analysis. Mm -hmm. But can't I just record the power traces for, let's say, all possible inputs of AES and uh, do that on a dummy device, some, some other device, and then match the traces that I've seen? All possible inputs of AES. So this is like AES has 128 bit states. Yeah. So you would need uh, 2 to the power of 128 possible inputs. Oh, but, but maybe we can, maybe not the entire input, but maybe I can uh, go through some, some part of the AES. I mean, we did that with the T-table attack where we computed through um, the first round, for instance and we were able to directly obtain the 64 bits of the, of the key. Well, actually, yes, you have these, these 10 rounds of AES, yeah. Um, but these T-tables, which we use, they um, combine the steps of an AES round um, into a single table lookup. Mm -hmm. So you basically pre-compute one round of AES and then just do uh, the table lookup, which actually also includes the S-box lookup. Mm -hmm. And in general, the problem with these t-table implementations is that they can have non-constant time uh, behavior due to data caches, so these side effects, right? And besides that, these uh, t-table implementations, since they merge computations together, they require quite uh, a lot of RAM to do these lookups. And usually on embedded devices, you simply do not have access to such amount of RAM. If you have your AES computation, and you can find out uh, a specific intermediate value in the computation, you likely also learn information about uh, the round key. Okay. And if you have um, the key of one round, so one round key, you can also compute the other round keys. Okay. And uh, in case of AES, also attacking the first round is very convenient because um, that one corresponds directly to the actual key. 
Ah, yes. And also in, in uh, the tea table attack we mounted, we attacked uh, basically the, the lookup for a single key and plain text byte. And then we attacked the, the key uh, byte by byte. Yeah, that's basically divide and conquer at work. And then you also do not have two to the power of 128, but only two to the power of eight possible values per key byte. Right. And that's much better. Okay, but what then? Well, actually, you could create and match profiles for those two to the eight uh, inputs and the corresponding uh, key values. Okay. But that's actually still unnecessarily complicated. So you can do something much better, actually. Like what? Well, guess. I don't know. Maybe you could tell me. Guess? I don't know. I mean, just tell me what I should do. He's saying you should just guess the traces. Oh, guess, wait, guess the traces. The tr like, that's a long trace. I can't really guess an entire, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's more like um, you predict the power consumption for one operation within the encryption. So let's say you focus on the S-Box lookup. Mm -hmm. The S-Box lookup is actually a great target because the output of the S-Box computation is essentially a nonlinear combination of its inputs, meaning that if you have a small difference at the input, this will usually lead to a big difference at the output. In principle, we could attack any point in the algorithm where secret information is used. For instance, before the S-Box lookup, a plain text byte and a key byte are combined with an XOR operation. The result of this operation can take all kinds of values, but if you look at two different values for the key byte with the same plain text byte, you will see that the number of bits that are different between the two keys is the same as the number of bits different in the two XOR results. Now, this means that very similar keys are very hard to distinguish. Now let's consider a different point instead, right after the S-Box lookup. Now, this plot looks rather chaotic. We can see that where previously a 1-bit difference between the keys resulted in a 1-bit difference between the XOR outputs, now we have a kind of random looking distribution of bit differences between the S-Box outputs. Therefore, the difference in power consumption for different keys becomes much larger, and even key bytes with very small differences become easy to distinguish. And that means a big difference in the power consumption. And if you know the output of the S-Box, uh, that means that you can uh, recover the key quite easily by combining um, this information with a known plain text byte. Hmm. Okay, and then I measure them. Uh, no. Seriously, Daniel, if you could modify the key, why wouldn't you just change the key and be done with it? Ah, uh, I think I get it now. The key is fixed in the device? Yes. Uh. You guess what the value of the key byte is. You compute through this table lookup and roughly predict how much power would be consumed by that. Mm hmm. But how do I know how much power will be consumed? Well, for this we can resort to so-called power models. Those are essentially functions that let us roughly predict the power consumption of a certain data value that is processed by a certain instruction, for example a load and store instruction. And we usually have two common power models that we are using here. For example, Henning weight, which is essentially just uh, counting the bits of a certain data value and then and, and summing them up. And besides that, we also have Hamming distance. The Hamming distance between two values is the Hamming weight of the XOR between those values. So you just count the bits um, which flip when you um, like um, have the transition from one, one value to another. Wait, this is supposed to work? I mean, the Hamming weight will be something like zero to zero to eight. I mean, that's not not millivolts or something. I, I don't have any unit there. And how do I scale that to the to the actual power consumption? You don't scale and there is also no unit. You just want a correlation and you see whether it consumes more or less power. Okay. Well, this is exactly how it works. 
because with CMOS, the technology that most of our computer chips uh, are based on, um, they essentially work like that. The more bits are flipped, the higher the power consumption. Mm -hmm. So for each key byte, I would have 256 possibilities. That's 256 predictions I have to make. But also per input byte. Per, per input? Uh, you simply measure a bunch of AES encryptions with different inputs and generate the prediction vectors for the S-Box lookup. And then you just have to find correlations with that. But before that, let me actually show you how we can measure these traces in the first place. Okay, like for real? Yeah. Okay. So, and what then? Well, you take, for example, this M probe that we have here. Mm -hmm. You place it next to the card while it is communicating with the reader, and you basically take like 100 measurements, for example. So I need a lot of traces, a really large amount of traces. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Then if I take this, and I probably also need this here, and this, and wait, but my card is broken. But wait, we have the same permissions, right? Yes! <laughs> Sticking a couple of pictures there. I think there might be future use for that. You know, you should probably automate that. Automate that. Yeah, well, you can just try every offset actually for the alignment, and then you can check if both traces correlate with each other well, well or not. No, it doesn't work like this. I think I have a déjà vu. What? No, I I I recorded a bunch of traces. Mm, um, all right, show me. Yeah. Uh, am I supposed to see anything here? Yes, but... Uh, no, really no. Well, they are a bit noisy. N noisy? Noise? What do you mean? Well, uh, measurement noise. But if you, if you take two traces like here and average over them... Mm -hmm. Then you have one waveform instead of two. One less noisy trace. All right, whatever. <laughs> Have fun. And that works as long as they are statistically independent. Sure. Noise can be a challenging obstacle when performing side channel attacks. The noise is usually statistically independent of the secret, which is important for security. And the noise also usually follows a possibly unknown distribution around some value such as zero. However, this also enables eliminating the noise with statistical measures like averaging. Building the average over two traces doubles the signal while the noise converges, in our example, towards zero. With a sufficient number of samples, an almost noise-free average trace can be obtained. One challenge though, with averaging, is that the traces need to be aligned. The worse the misalignments, the more we move from clear spikes to broader hills until the signal again disappears in the noise. Therefore, making sure that the traces are perfectly aligned pays off as fewer traces will be needed to observe a signal. I, I still don't see anything. Yeah, is, is this just the average traces? Yeah. So, well, then you skip the last step. Uh huh. Uh, you generate these prediction vectors, one uh, for each key byte. Okay. But you have to compute the correlation. Oh. For example, you can use this NumPy function. Uh huh, okay. Uh, but correlation between between what? Your know, traces are aligned, so that means the specific S-box lookups should be at the same time. But we don't know what that offset is. Why don't you just scan over it? Scan over it? So uh, you take one prediction vector for the first key byte, guess zero, 
And then for each uh, point in the trace, you compute the correlation. Ah, and then you get a correlation value for each offset. A and then? Yeah, you just repeat that. So you have 256 guesses for each key byte. So you start with key byte 0 equals 1, key byte 0 equals 2, and so on. And then overall, this would be per key byte 256 guesses? Yes. That's what I started with. I mean, I have 256 possibilities for each key byte. No, but now you have a correlation graph for each key byte mm -hmm. and guess, and you can tell which one is the most likely. Uh, can you just scroll through the graphs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just open them. Okay. So here's the first one. Yeah. Is it correct? Open the next one. It looks very similar. Yeah. And the next one? Still similar. They all look more or less the same. Yeah. Okay. Oh. This one is different, right? So the spike here. That's key 137. Yeah, so that's uh, the correct value for key by zero. Okay. Yeah. But what now? I mean, you can just repeat that for every keypad, or you can also automate this. But I mean, you don't have to. You can just scroll well, through all the images. Well, that's a lot of work. So, well, that's also a setup that would work for our students for the... Ah, so they can use the same for the exercises? Yeah, exactly, yeah. But how do you ship the devices to the students? We don't, right? Um, I mean, we just ship them pre-recorded traces. Um, makes sense. That's it. That's all the key bytes. Let's hope the bits are correct. We're done? Yeah. Nice. Do you have any, I mean, dummy cards or something? Uh, we should have. I will go and ask Barbara where we have them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think we should also teach them how to mitigate these problems. Oh, I think we could write an entire episode about this. Yeah. Let's see whether this actually works. Oh, it actually worked. Constant time alone is not enough. It's data that this process on the device that leaves traces you know, in the power trace. At least uh, it's now uh, working again and I can enter the lab. That's great. Thanks for the help. Ah, oh, Daniel. Hi. I have a guest card for you. Barbara told me that your student card broke. Yeah. Uh, so. Thank you. You're welcome. I need a signature. Okay. I want the card back. Well, modern cards actually have many more security mechanisms. Maybe we should talk about them at some point as well. Lemmy, Robert, maybe you can take care of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something for the next episode, Lemmy. Uh, maybe uh, you can give us some keywords that uh, the students should start looking up? Yeah, I think uh, masking and hiding. Masking and hiding, yeah.